So this is a topic that's not specific to bladder cancer, but I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, something that's very much um, kind of on the, forf on, the, on the hot topics in terms of surgical treatment, management of postoperative pain, uh, and, and some strategies that we can do to um, address this. Um, I have no disclosures relative to this presentation. And by the end of this presentation, I hope that you will recognize some of the factors that led to the current opioid epidemic, identify consequences of excessive perioperative opioid prescribing, and identify some concrete strategies to reduce or cease altogether postoperative opioid prescribing in certain types of surgical cases. So this opioid crisis is ongoing, but it started a long time ago. Uh, back in the 19th century, heroin was a cough suppressant, cough suppressant and was readily available almost over the counter into the 1920s. Oxycodone, we, we then realized there were some significant risks to that and it was reclassified. But in the 1950s, oxycodone became widely available and I'm sure you've seen all of the media uh, surrounding oxycodone and, and manufacturing. But Abuse began then into the 1960s and 70s, and this was also influenced by cultural issues and veterans coming back from war with injuries and PTSD and, and things that were not really um, addressed in the right way. Uh, then in the 1980s, uh, there was this um, perfect storm, unfortunately, with medical articles underestimating addiction risk. Uh, some of these were funded by industry, and that was not recognized or known uh, initially at the time. There was a lot of aggressive marketing coming to the patient around uh, the clinicians and around the physicians. And then pain was... Um, uh, brought to the attention as a fifth vital sign. This fifth vital sign was something that was advocated to be checked along with heart rate and respiratory rate and needed to be addressed and managed just as much as the other standard vital signs. Opioid prescriptions in the United States were at baseline about 76 million prescriptions written in 1991. Within a decade, this was 126 million. And within another 15 years, over 200 million opioid prescriptions being written in a single year. Um, notably, there were more overdose deaths in the 12 months from the middle of 16 to the middle of 17 than all combat-related deaths in 27 years of the Vietnam and Korean Wars. This just illustrates that it's not just that more patients are, are illicitly using opioids, but the more that we have been prescribing, the more patients have been dying. The risk factors for post-operative chronic opioid use have been studied, and some of these risk factors include male gender, preoperative substance abuse disorder, uh, pre-existing depression, preoperative benzodiazepine or antidepressant use, preoperative opioid use, and certainly and also higher Charlson comorbidity index. Um, some of the benefits for reducing postoperative opioid use, there are a multitude. Uh, you will see fewer postoperative complications. There are a number of adverse events that are opioid related. These are ones that you certainly have seen. Patients having nausea, vomiting, inability to tolerate PO, hypotension, respiratory depression, altered mental status, urinary retention, and this is just a short list of these that are called ORADEs. Uh, there are also more significant respiratory complications, atelectasis and pneumonia, gastrointestinal complications including ileus, and then uh, DVT and, and PE, increased incidence related to the patients not moving around, uh, and, and increased falls. Longer term, um, if we can reduce postoperative opioid use, we may reduce the rates of postoperative addiction, and then there may be less diversion of opioid prescriptions beyond not, uh, the medical prescriber and user. Opioid-related adverse events occur uh, in up to 13% of patients that has been documented in, in hospital records. But if you ask patients, 40% of patients have had moderate adverse events related to their postoperative opioids, and 40% of patients reported severe adverse events or effects, side effects related to their postoperative opioids. One day prescribed supply of postoperative opioids has, carries a 6% risk of persistent opioid use at one year. This is following discharge. And a 3% risk of persistent opioid use at three years. And the, this is in patients without addiction history. By comparison, this is the rates of complications associated with cystectomy in the first column and prostatectomy either done robotically or open. And we have cardiovascular complications only 1%, 1.4%. Um, pulmonary complications 0.5 to 6%. Uh, thromboembolic complications, 1% to 6%, renal failure, and then overall, um, 
5% up to 30% as we know with cystectomy. But multiple surgeons and, and, and people concerned about this would argue that these rates of long-term opioid use are just as worrisome and significant as the side effects that we worry about and try to change our management because of. We do have existing guidelines that already incorporate strategies to lower the use of opioids after surgery. Enhanced recovery after surgery, how many are practicing some of these strategies in their, in their clinical practice? So ERAS is, is widespread. It can be applied piecemeal. It can be applied. It's certainly not something that requires following every element of the recipe. But part of the um, elements that can reduce opioid use include regional anesthesia. I'll talk a little bit more about adjusting intraoperative anesthesia. There are strategies your anesthesiologist can do to actually change the patient's pain uh, endpoints. Multimodal approach to reducing ileus using alvimapan, which is a, um, a GI-specific receptor blocker to reduce the effect of opioids on the gut. Uh, and then scheduling meds for nausea and vomiting to try to offset some of those side effects. And then using other multimodal postoperative medications that are non-opioid based. Regional anesthesia can be done one of two ways, either epidural or peripheral nerve blocks. These are some of the um, outcomes that have been documented evidence-based uh, in terms of using these regional anesthetic strategies. But this can be done either by paravertebral blocks or rectus spinae blocks. Uh, there are also multiple options for truncal fascial plane blocks. And if you have a regional team at your hospital, they're very familiar with these and they're trying new ones um, every year. But a lot of us have heard of tap blocks where they do transversus abdominis plane in injection of anesthetics, also rectus sheath or quadratus lumborum QL blocks. These can either be administered as a single agent with a long-acting anesthetic versus a continuous indwelling catheter or a liposomal, also long-acting injection. Both offer benefits for opioid naive and particularly for those patients who are already opioid tolerant. If you can reduce the pain they're having even immediately after surgery, you're going to have much better postoperative endpoints, outcomes. These paravertebral blocks can be used uh, uh, from the um, high levels down to T12. They're good for surgeries such as PCNL. Transversus abdominis are good for the T10 to L1 range and, and incisions below the umbilicus as well. Um, but they only get wider abdominal wall coverage and have inconsistent coverage in the midline. So if you're making a midline incision, a tap block may not do very well. There's also a rectus sheath block that your regional anesthesiologist will know about where that helps cover the midline inc incision better. And some of our teams actually do these in their operating rooms themselves and bill for it and include them in the surgical billing. Um, overall, most significant are that in the immediate postoperative period, you're going to have less hypotension and less retention compared to epidurals. So these, these regional blocks uh, are going to do a little bit better job of, of mitigating some of those things that we worry about with epidurals. Patient comes out of the OR and is hypotensive, you have to turn the epidural off and try to identify other strategies. The peripheral blocks can be given as a single injection when the patient's length of stay is anticipated less than 24 hours, or there are indwelling catheters uh, that can be left in place with a self-emptying um, self bulb that has a vacuum seal on it to help it deliver a sustained uh, uh, anesthetic dose. But bupivacaine can be used, which can be a 0.25% plus or minus epi, depending on the location, of course. And the dosing is very simple, one-to-one -one cc per kilogram of weight. This is uh, just a table that's good to know and have on hand, and you'll have these slides, but to have um, the different uh, acting agents and the um, onset and duration and maximum dosing. Epidurals uh, also have significant advantages in patients with cardiovascular and pulmonary diseases, where you're trying to lower their chance of side effects from opioids that are otherwise going to hinder their postoperative course. There is a Cochrane review that shows decreased 30-day mortality across many surgery types. This is a little hard to understand, but it probably has to do with the sequelae of patients having opioids, having other complications, versus the patients who have less use of opioids because of epidurals are going to have 30-day improved outcomes. So some of the options available to us medically include acetaminophen. It reduces postoperative opioid use as much as 30%. IV dosing is equivalent to PO dosing, or I should say the other way around. PO is just as good as IV and costs a lot less. Gabapentin and pregabalin can be used preoperatively, sort of a priming, set up the system, and then perioperative use to reduce perioperative morphine. Uh, NSAIDs also, scheduled 600 milligrams of ibuprofen. 
Uh, they have shown that 600 milligrams is, in essence, as good as pain control as 15 milligrams of oxycodone. And there's no increased bleeding with Toradol. That's been um, confirmed and established repeatedly. And COX-2 inhibitors are very useful in this setting. Perioperatively, people have also proposed, but there's a lot lower evidence for use of ketamine. That's, for example, during surgery for your anesthesiologist to use ketamine as a strategy. And there is also some rationale for dextromethorphan or ketamine preoperatively. Uh, and perioperatively, uh, interestingly, magnesium or IV lidocaine, uh, IV dexamethasone, uh, all have shown lower pain and lower opioid, opioid, opioid endpoints. So, the old way was opioids at the bottom to be the most prescribed, and then using PCAs, Tylenol, and then using regional, and then using some other newer strategies. But um, a lot of people would advocate that we should be doing all of these things first, and opioids last. So there's a mnemonic that's been created to give you some th guidelines to follow. I didn't put too much in here on this, but this mnemonic called ALARM, so that we can look at strategies that avoid opioids, including are medications in general anesthesia, medications for local anesthesia, and then uh, regional and multimodal. Um, this was a presentation, and I, I took a lot of some uh, the data that I showed here as well from a um, IC course at AUA 2019. But this was um, um, Mass General's algorithm that is widely spread across the um, institution, uh, where whereby depending on the surgery planned, um, a patient might be undergoing open or minimally invasive surgery, and they have very pre-set um, recommendations for the anesthesiologist and for the blocks, and then for the post-operative medications at the bottom. And they schedule acetaminophen up to 975 milligrams, schedule acetaminophen plus celecoxib, or um, generally that's, the, that's their uh, oral strategy, and then using these regional uh, strategies very liberally and um, anesthesia following certainly many of the ERAS principles as well during, during uh, surgery. If for exam another example is at our institution at the Bentop General Hospital, the trauma service has created guidelines that they have uh, distributed throughout the hospital and incorporated into order sets in, in EPIC so that the residents all have quick and easy access to it. This has reduced their discharge opioid rate to less than 5% after acute care surgery admissions. They use this multimodal pathway in the hospital, but the patients who are eligible for this must have normal hepatic and renal function. They uh, are also classified based on being opioid naive. Um, and upon discharge, the patient will be given seven days supply, uh, specifically based on the previous 24 hours of use prior to discharge. There will also be scheduled acetaminophen, recommended and prescribed for discharge. Scheduled ib ibuprofen, likewise, recommended and prescribed for discharge. Um, and they do use gabapentin inpatient, but never give gabapentin as an outpatient medication. But during the hospitalization, there's scheduled acetaminophen, NSAID, gabapentin, and tramadol, all scheduled. Then only rescue opioids on an as-needed basis, and a PCA for select patients, such as those who are, who are opioid tolerant already. And then you have to make sure to incorporate your bowel regimen to avoid some of the ileus and other um, nausea, vomiting, and antimedics. So um, in summary, there are a lot of opportunities here. I've given you a little bit of the background and, and a little bit of the data that, that this is based on. But it does take um, working with the people at your hospital. Speak with your anesthesiology team to see what they know and what they are willing to practice in terms of ERAS strategies. Um, look at the preoperative and intraoperative strategies that can, that can improve all of these um, endpoints. Identify a local champion for regional anesthesia. If you don't have an anesthesiologist already doing this, encourage them to add this to their armamentarium and have SOP guidelines for various types of cases. Um, this also extends to the nursing team so that there are proper expectations about scheduled and PRN dosing. And then also, even within your department, try to standardize what everyone is doing uh, in terms of in-hospital prescribing and discharge medication. There's a lot at AUA these last couple of years looking at national databases, looking at institutional databases, showing that we're doing a really bad job of having consistent uh, prescribing patterns for ureteroscopy, laser lithotripsy even, or certainly for our major operations that have bigger incisions. And we can be using a lot less opioids and prescribing a lot less opioids than we are right now. 
So let's build a new way to treat surgical pain, courtesy of my kids' sandcastle.